Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions and answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link. DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Okay, there you'll see the poser. Just click and you're on your way. Again, the link is DavidTempleBooks.com slash books. Otherwise, just head over to Amazon. Okay, thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. Guess who? Your host, David Temple. Good to have you here. And thank you so much for tuning in to our podcast. On today's show, I've got a fellow who reached out to me some time ago and has been on my radar for some time. And now that I've read the book, It Dies With You, Scott Blackburn. Oh boy, oh boy. Page Turner? Yeah. Mystery, murder, thriller? Yeah. Good? Oh, hell yeah. (laughs) It's good. So why don't you and I stop wasting time and get into the thriller zone? Now, there's a little bit of noise, but uh, that's just my dog eating a bone down at my feet, so we're okay there. I I unplugged my beer fridge out here so you didn't get that hum, so (laughs) there you go. That needs to be my opening line. (laughs) Well, I unplugged my beer fridge. Uh, Yeah, when I was trying to, when when I was thinking about doing a podcast last year, and then Tom, Tom has just gotten away from me. I was like, where am I going to record at? Then I was at my garage and I just kept unplugging everything. I was like, man, these blue Yetis pick up on everything. So yeah, I'm plugged. I am plugged just now. Mama, turn your hairdryer <laughs> off. And can you go out to the garage and turn my beer fridge out? <laughs> and while you're there, just bring me one. Would you pop it? Pop the top, <laughs> would you? <laughs> I can't start this early or I would have one right now. Hey, Scott Blackburn, welcome to the Thriller Zone. Glad to be here. Man, I have been looking forward to that. You dropped me an email on my personal website, not the Thriller Zone, a couple weeks before Christmas, I believe it was, like maybe two weeks, and we connected right away. Might have been that you dropped that clown Mark Westmoreland's name. Um, he hey. He's a dude, man. I like him. <laughs> Or how we share home states or how you said you liked the show and you thought I was probably the best podcaster in the universe. I think were my notes right. Was it the universe? Okay. That was a joke. Yeah. I said, said the galaxy, at least this galaxy. Okay. That's what I said. (laughs) Whatever, whatever I said worked. Apparently. Either way, here we are, right? Yep. All right. I am anxious to talk about your literary debut. It dies with you right here. And I, I'm going to tell you straight up that I, <laughs> the wife and I were, we had a, we had a long day yesterday and we're, we're getting ready to call at about eight thirty nine 9 o'clock. And I said, babe, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta finish this. I gotta be true to Scott. So I'm going to, I'm going to spend another couple hours or so that lasted 15 minutes. So I was up at five to finish that this morning and, uh, it was well worth the, the journey. Great. We're going to talk about it in a minute, but I, first I want to. Awesome. I want to know about you because uh, let's begin with where you live, which is just down the road a piece from where I was born and raised in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Yeah, I'm probably eight miles from Winston, so we're yep. Yeah. You got to be what you're. You're in between High Point and Winston. I am. I am in High Point, so I'm right dead between Winston and Greensboro, and gotcha. pretty close to Kernersville. So I'm kind of like right there in the middle of all that. Kernersville. Now we're talking barbecue. Yes, absolutely. 
Oh, yeah. Mate. See, I live I, I live near Highway 66 right there. So, 66. yeah, there's some good barbecue joints. And uh, and the coleslaw in the South, in that particular region, especially Kernersville, is different than anywhere else. It is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Vinegar. Anyway, uh, it, I, maybe that's one of the reasons I so enjoyed your book, Scott, because you, you took me down memory lane. I have not been in that area in quite some time. But you and I'm going to get to this later, but it just man, I was just all these memories were flooding back a little bit of the accent, which wasn't overdone and the sense of place, which I'm going to talk about. And, uh, you know, I, I heard a reference to Forsyth County. I want to remember, which uh, I was born at, in Forsyth County. I mean, it was just such a fun little trip down memory lane. Awesome. Also, High Point Furniture Capital of the country uh, at one time, if it's not still. It is. It is, yeah. at least by name. They still have big market here two times a year. I don't think it's as big as it used to be. But, no. Uh, but no, it's it, still here. It's, uh, yeah, t twice a year. All right, so now, were you born in that area? I'm just curious. I was. I was born in Randolph County, so okay. maybe – uh, geographically, I don't know where anything is. I think that's 10 miles south. I say south because the accents are thicker there, so I'll just go with south. But, uh, yeah, Randolph <laughs> County. It is south. It is south. I swear it is. I'm looking to see a map right now, but, yeah, yeah. It's south. The yeah. souther you go, the deeper it gets. Right. And my parents still live there, so they're uh, roughly 20 minutes away, and I teach in Randolph County, so my job's about 20 minutes away. Okay. Awesome. Why do you, I'm going to start off with this question now that we've gotten acclimated to our birthplace. And uh, it's funny, and, and this is going to sound, I don't know what this is going to sound like. When I saw your photograph, I thought, especially the photograph on your website, which is Scott Blackburn words, uh, you look, it looks like a motorcycle jacket and you look like, you know, you look like a guy in Jersey who goes like, oh, you got something to say? Why don't you get a little bit closer? You know, and let me wipe yep. that smirk yep. off your face with the side of my fist. And that's then exactly what I was going for. I was going for that. <laughs> we'll talk about that. We can talk about those pictures. Yeah, uh, I, I, I can talk right now about them. But uh, uh, yeah, that it's it's an attention getter. And as I said to you off mic earlier, I'm like, yeah, if I if I if I batted in that direction, I would have said, hey, honey, I <laughs> I got a trip to make. But um, what? Tell me about the photograph. What's that all about? Um, well, I knew this was, I think. A little before I went out on submissions with my agent, um, and I was like, I better get some headshots made. So I called a buddy of mine uh, that does that, and that's actually in High Point in the furniture district where I took that picture at a place where like kids go and like smoke weed and do things they shouldn't do and, and do graffiti. It's called The Wall. It's where the train depot is in High Point. Yep. It's kind of behind that. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I knew I was writing, a, I knew I'd written a crime novel. So it's like, uh, I guess I can't really smile in these pictures. So I did smile in some and, uh, and that one and some others I didn't, but, uh, that's the one I went with. Um, I usually smile in pictures. I don't try to be tough, but I was like, I'm a crime writer, or I guess, I guess you could call my, me a crime writer. So, uh, well, no, you I, can I'm call serious. yourself. Yeah, you you can call yourself a crime writer because it's what this book is about is a crime. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's actually, definitely a crime. Yeah. Definitely more than one actually. Yeah. And, yep. uh, and you know, if you if you need to smoke a little weed and paint a few walls just to get in the mood, <laughs> whatever it's. I'm from California. I mean, I'm in California now, so all that stuff's legit. I mean, graffiti is go. now just street art, and weed is legal. So, actually, I'm high right now as I speak. Uh, <laughs> I guess you, sometimes you have to be to to, uh, to put up with me for an hour. It's okay. I'll take it. I'll take whatever it comes my way. But I wanted to start off with this question. Why do you think that Southern writing, and we were, we were kind of referencing this earlier, and writers from the South in general is experiencing such a groundswell? I think it's experiencing a groundswell. And then you were kind of saying, well, I'm, you know, maybe it's not quite what it is. But why do you think that is? Because it clearly is. Yeah, yeah. I think it's coming back. Um, and I'm not sure if it ever went away, but um, I think... I went to school in New Hampshire for my MFA, and as soon as I got off the bus there, people wanted to talk Southern fiction because I was the guy from the South. So it's always been popular. Mm -hmm. You know, when you ask people their favorite novelist, they always pretty much name a Southern novelist or uh, mm -hmm. Flannery O'Connor, um, stuff like that. So I think it's always been there, but I think the South maybe has, has developed in a different identity. Um, 
now the new South is obviously much different than the old South, or at least for the most part it is. So I feel like I wanted to be a part of uh, a generation that is writing the new modern South. And, um, and hopefully I've done that well. And we, you were also talking about how I didn't do the accent thing in the book super yeah. heavy. Yeah. That, that was on purpose. I wanted it to be accessible. And, and you're talking to me now. How, how would you rate like, oh, all right, compare me to Mark Westmoreland, uh, your former guest. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's use a scale. This is so far. <laughs> let's, let's use a scale of one to 10, 10 being, uh, uh, about where I am because I spent so many years in radio. So I kind of form right. formulated my accent away. However, when I get to talking to you, it automatically comes back. And this is not an affectation because I, I spoke with, uh, uh, Bobby Matthews and Ashley Irwin yesterday, yep. uh, back to back shows. And by the end of it, uh, I walked in the kitchen. I said, baby, you want to, let's get some dinner. And she said, what is <laughs> going on? What, where did my husband go? So I'm at one now, generally speaking and 10 is Mark is knocking on ten's door. I'd give him a nine. I have heard deeper. I would put you at about a seven. Okay. Okay. I'll take a seven. You're a seven. Now, what generally, and this is a point I wanted to bring up later, but I'm going to jump to it now because we're doing it. Generally, I meet people who talk about Southerners and or they re, uh, write it, refer to it, and they plant it, like you just said, referenced it, as though it's a 12. And I'm like, you know, you don't have to go to 12. The button only goes to 11. So you don't have to go to 12. Right. And so what I, one of my points I was going to make to you is that I like the fact that you didn't, you didn't take it to 12 and you didn't, you didn't beat me over the head with it. You gave me enough that I knew exactly where you were and you know, the double, all you have to do is say double wide or single wide once or twice. You don't have to go, you know, trailer park, trailer park, trailer. Park. We got it. Everyone has seen Ozarks, you know. <laughs> good, good. Cause I was really going for that. I wanted it to be uh, accessible. So I made the narrator sort of like me, maybe a six or a seven. Now, some of the other characters, you know, like Charlie, they get closer to a 10, but yeah. the fact that I'm narrating first person, I wanted it to be more accessible to people that, uh, you know, that are maybe put off by every line being super dialectical because I don't speak that way. I, I can, I can get there depending on who I'm around. Well, sure. I mean, if you and I had uh, popped a couple of cool, uh, coolies and uh, and just, you know, unwound it and we didn't have to be in front of any cameras or microphones, I, I'd i probably turn, I'd probably get close to 10 anyway. So, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's kind of who you are. It's not a, yeah. it's not an affectation. It's just kind right. of, because I go home to visit my family in you know, I got a, a brother in Hendersonville. I got a sister in uh, outside of Asheville. I got another sister in Charlotte. You know, mm -hmm. you go back home, you can't help but just kind of ease back into it. It's kind of like a, your favorite flip-flops or your pair of jeans or something. It just goes that way. You're an English instructor also, which is yes. kind of like your day gig, right? It is. It is. It pays the bills. Not well, but it pays them. But you're doing what you love, right? I am. I am. Dude, this right here, I want to make this point. What you're doing right now is exactly what you want to be doing. Certainly. And my wife and I talk about this all the time. It's about being present. We are so caught up in these darn things, you know, mm -hmm. and thinking about what, what's happening in the world that we're missing or we're thinking about tomorrow, planning about tomorrow, that we lose sight of where we are now. And I was out with some friends this past weekend. We're up in a tiny little town up in Julian, up in the mountains. And we were just walking through this tiny little town and it took me back to where I grew up. And I was like, man, I was just in the moment. And my point is that people like you, are li literally living your dream. You're teaching, which you love. You're writing, which you love. And you're damn good at it. And, you know, you got two kids and, I don't know, you, you, you're present. Yeah, it's it's a cool season. It's not an easy one, but uh, it, it's exactly where I want to be. So I'm grateful for it. So back to this Mountain View MFA. Uh, why Southern New Hampshire University? Because of this particular degree? Uh, yeah, so... What's the laugh about? <laughs> you're, you're about to find out because I think you're going to laugh too. Uh, so a little fun fact about North Carolina, they took master's pay away from teachers. 
All right, we're already about last in pay. Yeah, so if you have a master's, you don't get paid for it. And what? I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. But here's the deal. I was, I was like, I don't want to be a novelist. So I was like, I don't, I don't know how to write a novel. Um, I know, sort of know how to write just because I read and I try to imitate what I do. But I was like, I'm going to have to have somebody really kick me in the ass to make me write a novel. So it's like maybe an MFA will do that. Plus, it'll allow me to teach community college, which I do. So there was a it was kind of a double thing going there, but mostly to to kind of learn how to write a book. And I'm not saying you have to get an MFA to learn how to write a book. Uh, no way. But um, so here, here's the funny part. I was looking at I've been writing less than six or seven months total. And I was like, I'm just going to apply for an MFA and send something I've written in. So I applied to three. I got into all three. One of those is where Wiley Cash teaches. All right. And I was like, man, that was the farthest away. The others were completely online. This was low residency. So I would go up there one week in January, one week in June. And I was like, man, this one's going to really be a huge sacrifice. But Wiley Cash is teaching there. All right. And I know he's a great writer. I didn't know how good of a mentor he would be, but I got in and I chose that one. And so two weeks a year, I was living up there and, uh, you know, for those two years, he was pretty much my my one on one mentor the entire time. And he was like extremely brutal. Like some people in the program would have him switched out to a different mentor because they couldn't take what he would lay down. And I loved it. I was eating it up. You know, it would crush your soul for a minute. It'd be like, hey, this is what I need to become a better writer. And so um, originally I had stalked him a little bit on Facebook and sent him a message like, hey, man, he's still teaching at uh, SNHU or or so they fund Mountain View. And he was like, yeah. And he said, when I showed up there, he's like, oh my God, it's the guy from Facebook. He was serious. And, uh, and we, we got along great. And he did, um, he did a lot for me. So, you know, people who want to go into something to better themselves and then want an easier way to do it, piss me right. off. <laughs> you know why? Yeah. Uh, how are you going to get better? You want, you want to, do you want to hear what you want to hear or do you want to hear not. what you need to hear to be the best you can be? Yeah. And I needed that. And I still need that. Um, some of the people, if I send my work to anyone, it's going to be someone I know is going to be brutally honest with me. Cause I need yeah. that. I don't need them to pat me on the back Yeah, at all. I don't need that. You know, it's funny. I think about my, ever since I was a kid, I want to be in radio. That's all I ever wanted to do. I want to be on the radio. My voice changed early, blah, blah, blah. And I'd go work for guys and they were always, man, you got a nice voice. You're going to be good. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm like, I know I'm going to be good because this is what I want. I'm going to do everything. There you it, go. Was, it was the assholes that I worked for that came to me and we would do what's called an air check. So they take you in your office after you're done. They listen back to your show. It's scoped down version. And, and, and I'd have guys like go, why the hell did you say that? How come that joke went 17 seconds? You could have done it in 12. And about here, why was your beat off there? And what, what, and I was like, early on, you're like, ah, maybe this isn't <laughs> for me. But after a while, you're like, yeah, by, trial yeah. by fire, uh -huh. sharp, you know, hardens the steel. So I loved it. And uh, that's, you know, that's why you get to New York and Chicago and L.A. But there you go. I love that story. And I love the fact that that you went to, that you knew innately that the chops to get to the place, to have the chops that you needed, you had to really sharpen the, the metal, right? The, the sword. And yep. I want to ask this, what would you say was the single best aspect of taking the time to earn an F MFA? I mean, outside of the obvious, but what was the best aspect of that? Uh, relationships, hundred percent. Um, I met some great people up there, uh, you know, that don't not only helped me with my writing, but just became good friends. So um, I wasn't paying for friends, so to speak, but uh, yeah, yeah. that was definitely a byproduct that was just amazing. And uh, some of my closest friends today, you know, they live nowhere near me. Uh, one in uh, John Vercher up in Philadelphia, right? Dave Maloney, um, who wrote Barker House, he's in Bo he's near Boston. He's actually in New Hampshire now. And then other people spread around the country. Uh, and those relationships have been great, especially when you get out to querying and, uh, and submissions and you can feed off of those people. Um, but yeah, that I thought that was amazing. Now, you made a comment that you don't have to get an MFA uh, to be a writer. And I get that. There's a whole right. lot of great writers that do not have that level of education. However, I will say this, and I'm staring at, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 books, a stack. 
uh, most of which I've gotten through to do this show, many of which yet remain. However, the cats that took the time to do the MFA, I can't tell you what it is, Scott. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but there is a difference. There is a palpable difference in the guys who went that extra mile. I, 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 I'm going to... I'm going to really search and come back to you on it, but there's something about it that I don't know if it's that you don't waste. Let me, I'm doing a little therapy here too. I don't know if it's that you don't waste time that you don't, uh, that you've taken out all the fluff that every, that a lot of writers feel like they've got to stuff it full of fluff, you know, to elaborate. And I used to be one of these guys, I'm going to elaborate the off the, uh, the app. Sorry, I wouldn't write. (laughs) Uh, the, the atmosphere and, and make sure you know every little thing about every minutia of detail about uh, where I am and what I'm seeing. And at the end of the day, I'm like, first of all, I want to know what the characters are all about and what they're saying. But I want, I, I, I feel, I feel smarter when I'm reading guys like yourself that have written it, that I just like, man, it's just a clean shot straight through. Does that make any sense whatsoever? It does. I think when, when I first went up there, I was, I was very raw. I was. Uh, and I think the only reason I got any attention up there is because I was like the only Southern writer. And so whatever I put out, they thought was different, which sometimes was a good thing. So, so I got a little more attention in, in some workshops, I felt like, uh, just because of that. But when I, when I look back on some of the stuff I submitted and that other authors or future authors submitted, it did have a lot of that fluff. And then over, I think it was because we were trying to impress people. All right. Yes. Uh, hey, we're, you know, our, our workshop mentors and, and uh, our teachers are, are novelists and, uh, you know, well-respected. So like, let's, let's really show off. And by the time you leave the program, I think if you did it right, and if you were in the right hands, a lot of that stuff is washed off. Um, when, before I went on submissions and, or wrote a novel, I remember a buddy of mine, he says, make sure you wash the MFA off of that. If that makes any sense. Because I think we we do we fluff things up we we try to use flowery language when it's not needed and I'm not saying there's not a time and place for it but it's not needed in what I write so right. um, I felt like if I'd written that three or four years ago yeah it would have had a lot of fluff I would have talked about the way a mountain looked for you know you know 300 words as opposed to 12 right so <laughs> uh, yeah I totally get what you're saying 100 yeah. percent yeah well it, it is it, it is a, a might have been a whole lot of words to say a compliment that you're a damn good writer, but there I it is. I appreciate it. Yeah. I also know that you're a damn fine boxer, uh, having trained in also uh, Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, which, by the way, you got a black belt for. I mean, you don't you don't just go out and go, hey, listen, I'll have uh, I'll have the black belt, please, and a <laughs> side of uh, black coffee. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I grew up doing martial arts. Now I'm not. I'm not much of a boxer, but they used to put me in there with professionals and they beat the hell out of me. So, I mean, so a lot of what Hudson talks about in the book, I mean, that is, I was no pro boxer, but I was around him. So a lot of what I write about him, the stuff I learned from being in a a gym with, uh, with people that had nothing to lean on except boxing, people that grew up with absolutely nothing. So they poured their whole life into boxing. Um, And then being around people who trained MMA and jujitsu and things like that. So I think, I really wanted a narrator that could use some of that experience. And I think that's what set this novel apart from a previous one that I had submitted uh, that never actually sold. And we can, we can talk about that too in a little bit. (laughs) Well, I've got a a great, uh, uh, a semi dissertation on one of the reasons that I like this book. I'm going to get to in a second, but first I want to say this. And, and now that you've told me that you're not literally a ass kicking boxer, I don't know that this patently obvious question that I was going to ask is going to really hold up, but I was, I was going to say, what's the worst part of boxing? Again, not the patently obvious. Well, getting hit. I mean, there's, you know, but then I was going to ask, what was your favorite part of the sport? So you can transfer those questions if you like to jujitsu, and that would be equally as fantastic. Well, I think it applies to everything uh, combat sports related. And really, yeah, get, yeah, getting hit is not fun. Getting hit in the body is worse than the face. <laughs> um, and I think it just goes back to what is the worst of all is just complete exhaustion where you feel like you can't hold your hands up and protect yourself. And I think in the book, Hudson rem- it mentions that he had a dream at some point where he's stuck in the ring and his feet aren't moving and he can't keep his hands up. 
yeah, yeah. that exhaustion really is is the worst part. And especially if you know that you could have done something to, to, to fix that exhaustion, whether it was your nerves or uh, training harder beforehand. But yeah, I think that part is, is pretty brutal. I want to take it one step further though. Like what do you think is one of the most useful aspects of, um, of the sports you practice? I mean, besides, besides keeping in shape, because you're, you, you're not going to practice jujitsu and then you're going to sit around and pound a 12 pack and a box of, uh, you know, dinglings or something, but, uh, uh, I think it's that step-by-step -step discipline you learn that you can't take another step until you, you know, basic, you know, you master the basics. And again, I use my narrator to talk about that sort of thing where, where you learn footwork, you learn how to walk in the ring before you ever throw a punch. And I think that applies to, to everything in life. Um, as a writer, I definitely think it applies. You can't, I think a lot of young writers sit down and they, they imagine their shiny book cover on shelves, but they're not willing to take those hard initial and sometimes boring steps to get to the point. Um, and sometimes that's just reading a ton. Um, sometimes that's studying craft. Um, so I think that that aspect of combat sports, that starting with absolutely nothing, just a tiny foundation, I think it just applies to everything and it teaches you great discipline. Did I read, was this your story? And forgive me for asking it this way. As he was being trained, he started in a tiny little square in the corner and he had to master maneuvering that corner before he could do anything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's called walk in the box. Yep. That was me. Okay, <laughs> you good. got it right. Yep. That was me. Good. Well, okay. So this is going to tee me up perfectly uh, as to what I really enjoyed about the story. Besides the fact I've already gushed all over it. Um, the characters, first of all, were real. I liked that right. fact. They're not, as I said, reference earlier, not overdone affectations of what you, of what a lot of non-Southern writers will do. Also, I like how you used uh, Hudson's background of boxing to pepper not only his behavior, but how he saw life. And th these are my words, just the way I interpreted it, how he saw life. What I mean by that is, you know, the way he saw life uh, as a ring and how you have to face uh, life square on back to the feet work. You have to have a good stance where it all starts and be ready to take the punches that life throws at you. So that little quiet, almost subconscious metaphor that lived in the space while I'm reading the story was, it was like the perfect foundational work. Yeah. And I think, um, I think when some people pick it up, like, Oh, this is a boxing novel. No, it's a novel where a boxer is, is, is going through life and, and, and navigating some tough relationships. Um, and that's what I wanted. I didn't want to write a boxing novel. If I want to write a boxing novel, I will, I don't know if anybody will buy it, but, uh, yeah, I could do it probably, but that's not what I set out to do, but I wanted a narrator that was different. And there's not a lot of narrators, um, that are combat sports or professional fighters especially ones that don't spend a whole novel beating the shit out of people. And he doesn't do that. Right. Well, you had me at the first, uh, I'm, I'm only going to read the first sentence. I was bouncing at red door tap room on a Friday night in January, which all but guaranteed that I'd be earning every last cent of my paycheck. You had me right there because guys, a bouncer, you know, uh, you're probably not a doctor in your spare time while you're bouncing on weekends. You know, you're not a, a you're not a district attorney. <laughs> You know, right. you're, you're probably uh, no disparagement to anyone in my audience who bounces, but I mean, you know, you, you get my point without having to say Oh, it. I get it. I get it. Yeah. I wanted him, um, I wanted him to have a little danger possibility open in the book that way. Um, I yeah. guess if you're a bouncer, you're, you're always facing danger, but, uh, and I think that's another reason I consciously wrote, uh, his part as a pretty witty, intelligent guy. Cause I didn't want to get him to get that stereotype. Like I've been hit too many times. Cause I think someone in the book accuses him of that. And he's like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not punch drunk. Um, right. And so I wanted, I wanted him cause I know a lot of fighters um, that are uh, just, just highly intelligent people. Um, one of my professors in college was uh, you know, he was a black belt in Jiu Jitsu. So, I mean, I want, so I, that was a very conscious decision to write his dialogue and write his narration the way I did. Let's take a step back. If you had indeed overdone the Southern thing and then made him punch drunk, uh, you know, uh, I've been hit too many times and then had him living in a trailer, it would be, there would have been too much chance of cliche that I would have just gone, oh, well, 
Uh, I see where this is going. And that wasn't the case. I think I would have done that five years ago. Um, I remember when I was writing my previous novel, again, I'll mention it again, it never sold. It's never going to sell because I'm not going to put it back out there. But um, I remember when I was writing the first draft of that, and I think it was Wiley that told me, he's like, man, you're just going down a checklist of things that are Southern and you're making sure you say them all in a book. He's like, you have to mention barbecue, cheer one, uh, and like 10 other things. And I started laughing. And I was like, damn, he is, he is right. Cause I purposely, it's like, I got to make sure people know this guy's from the South. I got to make sure he's, he's, he's chugging cheer one. And a lot of people listening right now are like, what the hell's cheer one? Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah. Cheer one so, is kind of like soda meets Dr. Pepper after a fashion. Yeah. There you go. There you go. So, um, I think going through that with him, I knew when I wrote this book, you know, I could subtly mention things. He does mention tenderloin biscuits and barbecue, but there's definitely not that, that checklist. I'll like, Hey, I got to make sure people know I'm from North Carolina. Damn it. Like I didn't, I didn't go down that road and I'm glad I didn't. I don't honestly, it probably would have never even sold to be, to be honest with you. No, it wouldn't have. And that is not to say that you can't do that. I mean, um, but it's it's the people that do all the things that everyone expects. I heard this phrase once, Scott. I want to I want to see if I can do this without butchering it. They said that if you if you speak a cliche and you speak cliches repetitively, that on a visceral level the listener tunes you out. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it happens almost just electronically. That's not the right word, but that's the gist I'm going for that. You just, uh, cliche, cliche. And I think the same thing goes with the reader. If you're reading and you're like, oh, a Hollywood detective that is, uh, got a disgruntled boss who drinks too much and has left his wife, you know, not that that shit doesn't happen. It's just that it's, it's been done. Yeah, it's been it's almost like you're finishing the sentences before you even read them because you know exactly what they're going to say. That's even Um, better put. Yeah, there you go. And we'll be right back. There was a time I built my own websites. (laughs) I was pretty good at it, but it took a lot of time and a lot of energy, and it was not without challenges. I mean, I built them on Squarespace and TypePad and WordPress and GoDaddy and Wix But in the end, it was kind of more hassle than it was worth. And then then when it came time to get hacked, I I, I just had it. Then on top of this, when I decided to become a full-time writer and I, I said, you know, I need a website that shows who I am and does it well and I don't have to worry about it and they take care of everything, including getting hacked, which has never happened, ever. I researched some of the biggest guys in the industry. A lot of those names you know. I wanted to play with the big boys too. So you know what I did? I found the company AuthorBytes.com. AuthorBytes.com takes care of everything 24-7. It has been delightful. And fortunately, to help pay for the show, they've become a sponsor. They did it last month. They liked the results so well, they're coming back for another round. And I'm pretty excited about it. If you will use the code the Thriller Zone, they will simply give you three months free with a one-year contract. What? Yes, there is still free in the world. Sign up for a one-year contract, get three months free using the code the Thriller Zone. And do like I did. Let the professionals handle it. Slide the keyboard away. Forget about the software and the updates and the plugins and all that craziness. Let the professionals do it. Have peace of mind. Authorbytes.com. Hey, I'm Scott Blackburn, author of It Dies With You, and I'm hanging out with my buddy David Temple here on The Thriller Zone. And now back to the show. You know, uh, this is The Thriller Zone. We generally speak about thrillers. I am starting to slowly expand my scope to be, uh, I've been doing it for a while. I'm just now saying it officially thriller murder mystery you know and just kind of stretch the boundaries a little bit more because thrillers have always been to me you know mysteries who done it thrillers how's it going to get done you know kind of a thing or how, right 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 how yeah fa- how fast are you going to do it <laughs> um but uh, this murder mystery was uh you know it was comfortable and familiar i mean the son estranged uh, from his father in search of his killer so that you know if if you and the fact that they were 
disenfranchised actually helped a strange same thing um helps build that heart connection because you you know they're pushed apart but something's still your daddy i mean one or the other right Um, yeah that that was that was the uh that what you just said was the premise of the entire novel that was how it came to be it was a conversation i was having with somebody about their estranged father and i and later i was thinking about what if that dad had just left them a crap ton of money or something like what a weird thing to consider especially if you really 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 didn't expect to get something um and it also that's where i got the title because the same conversation you know he was talking about his dad and uh some of the things he'd done and said over the years and he said man it dies with him and all that does with him and so i was like damn there's my there's my novel right there and so i went for it i I started writing that night i'm pretty sure well the thing that haunted me, and I'm going to say this, and if you think it's a spoiler, I'll cut it out, but the thing that haunted me, it grabbed me by the throat the minute it was done. I never let it go far out of my psyche throughout the entire book, and I kept praying on some kind of a subconscious level that I would get an answer to it, and that was the phone rang, and he didn't answer it, and he never knew. And that, to me... Yeah, that was one of the last things I added to the book, by the way. I was oh. like, I need some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's not a spoiler. It, okay. It's fine. Uh, but I remember thinking there needs to be something, this this extra little incentive for him wanting to figure out what happened. And it's the fact that his, his dad had called and he did not answer. And it could have possibly saved his life, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what the call was about because it didn't happen. Uh, yeah, and it doesn't really or, matter. Or the combo didn't. No. Yeah, the fact that you had that in there. So it's so brilliant that your intuition told you to add it last because that thread is what made me go through this book. I could have just gotten a glimpse of what the book was and we'd still be having a great conversation. But because of that thread, I had to read the whole damn thing. <laughs> you know? Good. That's good to hear. Yeah. I actually have my book's not out in the world yet other than early readers, but I think you're the first person to mention that specifically. So that's good to hear. Yeah. Nice. Well, mission accomplished. Um, okay, and I already said this about the thing that I want to just want a, a couple of bullet points. The sense of place was so good and you didn't have to say, uh, you know, like you said, you didn't have to say kudzu and, uh, moon pie and cheer wine and NASCAR. You know, <laughs> it was all built in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I knew I knew it would come off as exact. Like I feel like the people that don't live in North Carolina or the South that try to write North Carolina or the South do that, and uh, and you could man, you could spot it from a mile. And I'm not saying because I do mention some of those things, of course, but man, you you can you can spot a phony from a mile. If I try to write a book about New York, oh my God, I've been two or three times, but holy holy shit, it would be so, it would be so terrible. And people from New York would immediately be sending me emails. Yeah. Um, New Yorkers don't cut you a whole lot of slack. Now, I will, I will tell you, I'm, I do have a story that's been on my back burner for a while, and it does have to do with the South, and I grew up in it. But it, I'm going to mention fried chicken a couple of times because my grandmother made the best fried chicken in the world. I still have her mother's iron skillet, you know, the great wow. big ones that's, you know, about oh, – yeah. 15 and you can actually use it to lift uh, to work out instead of having to go to the gym (laughs) yeah i've got one yeah and the kind that you you never wash it you might maybe wipe it out with a damp thing but you're gonna pour salt in a newspaper to get that thing you know yeah yeah give it a once over every once in a while that's about it things like that that that's different because those are things that uh have a visceral connection and Mm -hmm. in you know to this moment, I, I, I was telling Tammy this the other day, my wife, about the way my grandmother, this is a tangent, bear, bear with me, uh, would cook. We'd come down to visit and she would cook. And you would think that she was cooking for the entire church, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, you think the whole, all the families were coming because she would cook. You'd, you'd have fried chicken and, and country ham and God. biscuits and gravy and collard greens still my favorite and with ham hock and green beans and mashed potatoes right so she and we'd walk in and like who's coming well it's just y'all you know every time we'd come it'd be like that 
those are the things from the South I miss, man. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can totally relate to that. Not to make you jealous, but I had my mother-in-law's homemade fried chicken last night. Uh, and then my mom's homemade collard greens earlier this week. So yeah, I'm right there with you. There is nothing on the world and you can't, you can't fake collard greens. Like if you go like in uh, out here in LA, uh, San Diego, they don't know what collard. Uh, okay. I'm going to get some heat on that. They do know what collard greens <laughs> is, but it's not like the South. Right. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, tangent. Um, all right. Now you have to answer this curiosity of mine because, um, I'm just uh, crazy like this. How in the wide world of words did you get repped by Trident media group? Only one of the biggest literary agents, I don't know, on the planet. Well, I, this was my second agent for the record. I had a previous agent, good agent. Um, we can talk about this later. Um, <laughs> But we didn't see the eye to eye on on this book. And I knew this book was the one from the, from the time I hit the end. I knew it was the one like I had no doubt that eventually it would find a home. And this agent didn't feel the same way. And I said, thanks for your time. Never spoke to the person again. And it probably never will. Um, and that evening, the agent I've been looking at for years, um, you know, behind closed doors was Ellen Levine at Trident. Uh, oh, that was my dream agent. All right. Always. So. That night I was a little, you know, I was a little down because I was like, man, I just spent a couple of years on this book and he didn't like it. And uh, but I really like it. And, you know, I'd love to have someone great represent it. And so I just, you know, I didn't sit around looking at my wounds. I was like, I'm going to freaking, I'm going to query Ellen Levine. So I sent Ellen an email, um, you know, told her about the book and said, Hey, you represent Michael Ferris Smith and Michael, uh, sorry, Daniel Woodrill. And I was like, you know, I think this might be up your alley. And uh, within three hours, she gave me a holler and she said, can I have this on an exclusive basis? Um, and so I was out walking. I remember my wife was was pregnant at the time. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And I was just like, holy shit. And I was, she's like, what? I was like, uh, this agent, uh, she wants an exclusive read on this. And so I gave her like, I think she requested six weeks and time gets away from you. Right. So after okay. six weeks, um, I still hadn't heard from her. Um, and so I was like, I, I'm going right back out there. I was like, there's no stopping me. I'm going to go query these other agents. Cause there's plenty of great agents out there. Um, sure. And, um, and I told her that and, and she was fine with it. But within like two or three weeks, I get an email from someone that's not Ellen, right? It's Martha Whittish, uh, Ellen's co-agent. And I didn't know who she was. And I was like, oh, what's she going to do? Let me down easy. And Ellen couldn't do it. Uh, <laughs> but but she said some great things about my novel and some things, some critiques that I totally agree with. I was like, oh, my God, like she gets it or, and what I'm going for. And so I was like, uh, but she didn't offer to represent me. And so what I did, I was like, maybe, uh, you know, I've got the bait out there. I was like, let's see if I can get that hook in. I was like. I was like, Martha, would you be up for a phone call? She's like, sure. Like, call me Wednesday. So I called her and about 45 minutes into our conversation, we're just talking about the book. And she's like, well, when we represent you. And about that point, I fell out of my recliner. I was like, what did you just say when you represent me? She's like, yeah, Ellen and I would be representing you. And she's like, since I co-agent with her. She was like, and, and if you want to talk it over with your wife, I was like, listen, I'll call my wife, but I'm going to call you back in two minutes because I already know what I'm going to do here. So I called my wife and told her. All right, then I called Martha back. So I have two agents, um, and now Martha's a full agent at Trident. So I feel like the luckiest dude in the world, and they've just been amazing. Um, and it's great to have a female agent as a male writer. I'll just put that out there. And same with my editor. It's great to have a female editor. Um, because they, they kind of soften you around the edges sometimes where maybe you were a little bit too harsh towards certain characters. Uh, I feel like they see certain things that I didn't see. So it's been, it's been awesome, man. It's been incredible. Dude, that is one of the greatest stories I have heard since I've been doing the show. I'm not, I shitteth you not. That is a great story. I am, I'm confident in myself, but I was, I was pretty, um, I was pretty shocked. I'll be honest with you. Um, I was like, wow. Cause I know it, it's tough out there. It's tough out there. It's really tough out there right now. Like super tough. And I might've gotten 50 more editors, sorry, agents that would have rejected it because actually while I was waiting on Ellen, you know, after her exclusive period was up, I got a couple of rejections, which I expected to. Um, but I'm God, I'm so glad that they rejected me because they weren't, in my opinion, even in the same stratosphere as Ellen yeah. and Martha. So yeah, I feel I feel super lucky. Um, and 
I do, I, I would give this advice to people querying, um, be very deliberate on who you query, not just everybody. I knew Ellen had dealt with literature like mine before. Um, and that's, and that's why I, I knew who she was. So I, I didn't feel like I was just like throwing up a Hail Mary there. I want to make sure that we put a, uh, a finger, a point toward that comment, a uh, highlight on that, because that is, that's just pure wisdom right there. Because I have, I have talked to a lot of people on this show, and there are a lot of people who are so anxious to get representation, without mentioning names, that they will take anything that comes their way. And I have three people right now I can think of that are kicking and screaming and hating themselves for the not one, but three book deal that they got um, that has not turned out the way that they wanted. Wow. Wow. And the reason I bring this up, because, you know, part of the reason the show is, I think, successful is because we tell it like it is and we don't softball it, is you really do, ha and you you have this thing. For, first of all, you got talent, Scott. Okay, there's a big surprise. You got dynamism, but you have drive and you have determination to find exactly what you want. And, and without sounding too woo-woo here, I'm a big fan of intention, really holding the intention on what you want and holding it specifically and not quitting, not giving up, not negating, you know, oh, maybe it isn't that good. I got 10 rejections. Oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. My neighbor didn't like it. No, <laughs> F that and keep going because if it's worth having it's worth fighting for and if it takes extra schooling great if it doesn't great but man if you don't if you don't just really hold that intention and go i mean i've always done that in my life and i'm like that's what i want and actually frankly i'm not gonna stop until i get that and if i can never get that at least i gave it every single dang thing i had yeah and, and i think that's the best advice you could give anybody and in, in any of the arts is that um, I think a lot of people throw in the towel so early. I'm, I'm talking, and, and, and you know this, like yeah. super talented people. And I'm like, years later, I'm like, hey, whatever happened to so and so? Oh, they quit writing. I was like, why did they quit? You mean they just stopped writing? Yeah, they couldn't get an agent or they couldn't sell their book. I was like, and they quit? I was like, how much do they really like writing or did they just want to be an author? Is there a difference there? Yeah. I think there is. Um, I wanted to be an author clearly, but I do love writing and I was not going to let anybody tell me what I could, I could or could not be in life. And I feel like writing is about the only pursuit you can give everything to and be really good at and, and possibly not make it. It's a weird, it's a weird concept, isn't it? Like, and say with, there's certain musicians that'll never make it that are immensely talented. No, dude, I was yeah. just I was just getting yeah. ready to say there's musicians. And listen, when I was coming up in radio, there are guys that I hung out with. That's all they wanted. And I'm like, yeah, but you got to be willing to really make sacrifices and really practice and really work and really want it and really play the game and know how to play the game and know how to maneuver it. Because if you want to make it to the top, by the way, it's a mountain peak. It's a tippy top mountain peak there's only so much surface area uh, that is there so only so many people can stand there let's let's use that as a metaphor okay if it was a really super huge uh, point being to over dramatize it then oh okay everybody can get up there sure dude you know but it's not <laughs> like that it's not the reason there is only one michael jordan to use sports was because Work ethic, Tiger Woods. Yeah. Work ethic, drive, work ethic. Well, every bit of that that you have, the, the pool of people you're being you know, chosen from gets smaller and smaller. And then it's just you and maybe a few other people because yeah. um, to, to, you know, if you look up statistics to finish a novel, that's a very small percentage of people that do it. Um, to land an agent, you know, even smaller percentage and to have that book sold, but all of it, um, but none of that happens with, if you're not extremely driven and you know, from the get go, what you want to do. And so I was not going to let anybody tell me that I was not going to be a novelist. Uh, and I knew this was the book. I just knew it. Um, yeah. and the, and, and nobody was going to tell me different. And I carried that confidence without, without being cocky about it. 
Uh, and I think it's the same when, um, when I was in school, people would get up and do readings and, uh, and someone told me like, hey, just have confidence up there because if you don't believe in what you're doing, not a single person in that audience is going to give a shit what you have to say. And I've and I've looked at I've looked at that in people now, and I'll be like, man, that guy just degraded his entire novel or what he's about to read. So I'm just going to tune out these next five minutes of this reading because he doesn't like it. Why would I like it? Um, so I, I think that confidence is a good thing to have because if you don't have it in yourself, you know, but nobody else will. I'll be honest with you. I'm going to take it one step further. I think confidence, like pure, true blue confidence, knowing that you can step into the ring to use your boxing metaphor and know that you can at least land a couple of punches that's going to leave this guy hurt in some way. You you might get knocked out, but you're, you're going to give it your best. Mm -hmm. I think confidence is 50% of it. I mean, yes. a flat, at least 50%. Because if I'm walking in the room and I'm confident, oh man, this is it. You're going to sense it, feel it, and you're going to be instantly uh, caught up in it, I would hope. <clears throat> yes, totally but, agree. But man, I, I'm with you. I've seen those people show up and go, now I wrote this book. I mean, you know, it's it's it's, it's pretty good. I mean, there, there are guys out there and write better than me, but you know, but but this one's good. <laughs> Uh, I think you're going to like it. I, I think you, I liked it. I, my mom and my dad liked it. I think, I think you'll like it. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm not sold. Yeah. I'm out. I'm out. Yeah. Give me another beer. I'm, I'm going back to the bar. Yeah, exactly. Totally. totally. All right. Well, um, I want to make sure that I don't, um, miss anything because this is such a thoroughly engaging conversation. And I know that I got rapid fire questions coming up, which I'm going to have a hoot and a half with you on this. <laughs> But I do want to ask you this, and I think we've already covered it actually, uh, accidentally, intrinsically somehow, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and that is this. And I want you to think about it because, well, you're a thoughtful guy anyway, so you're going to, you're going to dial it in pretty well. But what is your, if you, if you, and I ask this of all my authors, if you had to give one single piece of advice that, you know, people considering this as a career, you, you, you talk to students in your class all the time, probably. And they're wondering, Hey, Mr. Blackburn, should I do this? Do I have what it takes? You know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, maybe you're up and coming, maybe you're already in process, but what's that one piece of advice that you'd offer? I will, okay. I, I'm going to think about this for a second. Yeah, go right there's, a, there, there's a couple things that, this is actually, water. you sure that's water? Oh, it's vodka, sir. Straight ahead. Oh, okay, okay, good, good. I, I feel like I'm a little behind. Even though you're three hours behind me, I feel like I'm behind you right now. So. <laughs> um, I would say this, because someone asked me this uh, this week in a, in a written interview, um, and honestly, we just talked about some of the stuff, sure, but I think it's setting your your, your, your goals at the highest possible level. All right, so if you set your, my goal from, from the beginning of writing is I wanted to, uh, to win some awards. Um, it wasn't sell a certain amount of copies of books because you can write a novel that's not good and sell a shit ton of copies. All right. <laughs> so from the get go, I was like, I want to be an award winning author. All right. And, and, you know, and if that doesn't happen, I promise you it's not because I didn't believe I could reach that or, or that I didn't strive for that. And so I think that applies for, for every industry is, is, is just set your goals at the highest possible level. Um, and never back off an inch. How's that? I like it. And I, I, I could not agree more if I tried. It is absolutely a stunning piece of advice because you can say, hey, you know, I want to write. Oh, great. Okay. I know a lot of people want to write. I got more friends that want to, want to write that will boy, never... Oh that will, I can think of a couple folks right now and you're watching and listening and you know who you are. You know who you are. Um, and, and they, uh, how's that? We'll, we'll just use the name of uh, Frank. We'll just say Frank, Frank, how's that book coming? Well, you know, I, I want to get, I'm going to get, I'm wanting, I, I'm going to get started on it real soon. Cause I'm, I'm doing my research. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How's that working for you? I asked you the same question, Frank, uh, three, no, four years ago now. Oh, I've been busy. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, you got the point. Yep. I, I know, I know writers that way, musicians that way. And I'm like, yeah, uh, you know, you should have sold me years ago on the, on the fact that you wanted to do this. But, uh, yeah, at this point I don't believe you. So you just got to sit down and do the damn thing. 
got to grit your teeth. Um, you know, sometimes just go for it. Ladies and gentlemen, time for rapid fire questions. It's going to be a softball at first. Pen and paper or keyboard? Keyboard. Thorough outline or loosely sketched beats with a more pantser approach? Pantser all the way. What? Okay. Stop yeah. the press. Now that yeah. surprises me. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, I told someone this week, I was like, it dies with you is about 30, 30 words on a notepad. I was like, that was my whole, whole process. That's it. I, I, I don't, I think I'm one of those, uh, I'm not type A. My wife is type A. I am not, I'm, I'm the complete opposite of that. So I think when I start planning, I feel like I'm boring myself and I'm like, let's just do the damn thing. And so I start writing. Now I'm not subscribing to that method. I'm not telling you at home to use that method because it could get you into some corners you can't get out of. All right. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm totally a pantser. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I kind of let the characters take me where they want to take me. All right. This is so perfect. And here's why. Well, let's see. We're on month, what, 10? Yeah, we're on our 10th month of the show. And I've and I've asked everybody a variation of the same thing. And I've we've got all different kinds of people. We got we got them. Oh, I'm pure like you, pure pantser. And then we got an outliner that's a plotter. Okay. Now, did you hear Jeffrey Deaver's episode by any chance? I haven't yet, but I want to listen to that one. All right. Well, it, they don't get much better than that. When you want to talk about hooks and switchbacks and red herrings, I think he told me a hundred pages, no less than a hundred page outline. Yeah. <laughs> oh no less God. than a hundred pages. He said, because to devise, and here's the, here's the key. You're going to like this guy. The, the, in order to devise all those, I'm not going to, I'm going to use the word gimmicks, but I don't mean it in the cheesy fashion. Right. In order to do that, you got to have a pretty good roadmap or you're not going to know which road to take. So he's a big proponent of that. Now, I have always been, I just sat down and went kind of like you. Well, come on, let's go. And I just wrote him. Mm -hmm. And I had the time of my life. Then I started hearing, well, you got to write outlines. So I started going that direction. And I would sit there and beat the hell out of those outlines until I got to where I was bored because of the outline. I've now shifted back and I'm probably right in the middle, but th there are pros and cons to both sides. We'll just leave it at that. Right. Yeah. I do plan in my head. I write full, full scenes in my head down to the dialogue before they make it to the page, but I don't plan them out. So they're happening in my head while my wife's trying to have a conversation with me sometimes. <laughs> and she knows, she knows when I'm in writing mode and I feel bad. It's not on purpose, but Hey, when those, when those characters start talking, I, I guess I have to listen. So sorry. My wife, Tammy's going to love this. Tammy, are you listening? Tammy will, we'll be, we'll be out to dinner. We'll be taking a drive and it will have gotten really quiet for a while. And she'll go, where's your head? I'm like, and before I can answer, she goes, oh, working on a book, aren't you? I'm like, uh -huh. yeah, I'm working on mm -hmm. the book. Okay, here you go. <laughs> quiet library or noisy coffee shop? Quiet library. Wow. <laughs> Now that is another surprise. <laughs> wow. Okay. Number four, besides a cell phone or laptop, what's the one item you are rarely ever without? A water bottle. <laughs> Lastly, and ever so random, you have wrapped a day of running errands and you're suddenly caught in a life-threatening sticky situation with a big burly ugly dude with nothing to lose. The good news is your family is not with you. They're at home. The bad news is one of your arms are incapacitated and you're wearing flip-flops. Question is, which of the following items would you most prefer to defend yourself? A, a sack of groceries. Now, you don't know if it's canned tomatoes or baking goods. B, a handful of dry cleaning. C, a garden hose. And why? I would, um, oh yeah, I'm going with the clothes. The dry cleaning. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, because, you know, with my left hand, I'm going to throw it in its face as a distraction, sort of a jab. And then, then my foot, I'm going to lose that flip flop really quick and take out a kneecap. So I need to get his attention up here. Uh, there you go. There's, there's just some combat sports coming into this. <laughs> you did not disappoint. That's exactly. <laughs> no, no I've, already, yeah, I've already thought about this before, before you even asked me, you know, I play these scenarios in my mind all the time. I'm very situationally aware. Okay. Okay. 
Perfect. <laughs> well, folks, if you'd like to learn more, visit scottblackburnwords.com, or you can follow him as I do on Twitter at Scott M. Blackburn. What's the M for? Madison, my uh, unisex middle name. Mm. And by the way, don't forget to pick up a copy of It Dies With You come uh, June 7th. Or I understand that you can actually pre-order a copy now by going to your Twitter page. Mm -hmm. I've got the link in my bio. So give me a follow and order one for you and your grandmother who makes fried chicken, uh, whoever. Because I'll tell you this, diapers are really expensive. And, and we're changing a lot of diapers around here right now. So <laughs> hook a brother up, please. <laughs> How old are they? I didn't ask that. Um, uh, one is two years old and one will be a year old next month. So yeah, wow. we had those, they're within 15 months of each other. So yeah. And my, you know, people always say, you know how that happens, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, I do know how it happens. So <laughs> thanks for reminding me there. I brought the 10 on that one, didn't I? Yeah, you did. <laughs> this was so much fun. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to, that you'd like my listeners to know? No. Uh, I covered it pretty well. Uh, yeah, I think you did cover it pretty well. Um, if you ask for reading recommendations, um, I'm reading Mark's new book now. Uh, Violent Gospel? Yeah, the sequel. This, this, so this is the first book I'm ever going to blurb. So that was really cool for him to ask me that because um, I've never been asked before. Um, oh. So yeah, I, I'm about halfway through a morning song right now. Um, but yeah, be looking for that one. Um, isn't he gonna, writing that i feel like he's writing it on twitter because every time i spin across <laughs> he's putting some kind of a blurb up on there uh his own blurb and i'm like you know mark you can uh, save all that juice for later when i pick up a copy yeah he's gonna hear this so so be prepared to get a to to get a nicely worded email from mark uh <laughs> yeah yeah definitely man and he writes with some bravado and he does not lack confidence that's for sure um, no, he does and that'll, not. That'll serve him well. And if you're an agent or an editor out there, uh, Mark is available. Yeah. There you go. His uh, podcast buddy, David, is also available. Who what? is David? Me. Dave. Hi. Oh, David, David. I was like, is there another, is there another Dave around here? There, there are a lot of Daves. Uh, podcast host, you're talking to him right now. Of course, I have well, to. Hey, hey, yeah. So, so you're available. Yeah, the book is not yet available, but the book is in process. Can I just put it that way? So there we go. There I'm we only go. partially available. Yeah. <laughs> it's complicated. It's complicated. It's <laughs> kind of like a rom com. Well, there you go, dude. This was even more fun than I was expecting. I was expecting a pretty good a bit of fun, but it was a great fun. Oh yeah. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah. I, I like to talk shit. So that's, it. it's been a good time. Yeah. And I have a funny feeling we'll be talking a whole lot more. Absolutely. Scott, we're going to bug on out of here, but again, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Oh man, that was fun. Thank you, Scott. I feel like I've known that guy forever. Just that kind of people, right? Must be the North Carolina in us. Uh, be watching this guy and the book, of course, once again, it dies with you drops in June. You're going to be watching it. He'll be on your radar for sure. Now coming up on Monday, another newcomer got a bonus episode. Bobby Matthews has a book called living the gimmick. I don't have a copy in front of me, but because it hadn't been printed yet, but his book is coming out and we'll be talking about it on Monday. Then on next Thursday, I'm just jumping ahead because we have another monster talent, Mark Cameron. The book is cold snap. This guy is a monster, monster talent, and uh, very excited to have him on the show. That is coming up on Thursday. And then before we wrap up this incredible month of April, where has it gone? Peter Ferris, the devil himself. Boy, is this getting some kind of press. Rolling Stone calls it Southern Noir set to an infernal tempo. Cannot wait to get my hands on that. And that is coming up by the end of the month. We may have some more surprises lit in between there, uh, but I'm not going to mention them just yet. But I do want to say thank you so much for helping us move over the 100 mark on our YouTube channel, The Thriller Zone. Thank you so much for those kind reviews and those five-star reviews. And we appreciate it. And of course, you can always listen to us on all of your podcast channels. We like Apple Podcasts because they love our five-star reviews. I've got a whole... Another, I got another stack of books right here ready to talk about for May. 
but I'm not going to release the information just yet. But May is going to be practically record-breaking, and I cannot wait for you to be a part of it. So, I got some work to do. <laughs> I got to run. I'm David Temple, your host. I thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time right here on The Thriller Zone. There was a time I built my own websites. <laughs> I was pretty good at it, but it took a lot of time and a lot of energy, and it was not without challenges. I mean, I built them on Squarespace and TypePad and WordPress and GoDaddy and Wix, but in the end, it was kind of more hassle than it was worth. And then, then when it came time to get hacked, I, I, I just had it. Then, on top of this, when I decided to become a full-time writer, and I, I said, you know, I need a website that shows who I am and does it well, and I don't have to worry about it, and they take care of everything, including getting hacked, which has never happened, ever. I researched some of the biggest guys in the industry. A lot of those names you know. I wanted to play with the big boys, too. So you know what I did? I found the company AuthorBytes.com. AuthorBytes.com takes care of everything 24-7. It has been delightful. And fortunately, to help pay for the show, they've become a sponsor. They did it last month. They liked the results so well, they're coming back for another round. And I'm pretty excited about it. If you will use the code THETHRILLERZONE, they will simply give you three months free with a one-year contract. What? Yes, they are still free in the world. Sign up for a one-year contract. Get three months free using the code The Thriller Zone. And do like I did. Let the professionals handle it. Slide the keyboard away. Forget about the software and the updates and the plugins and all that craziness. Let the professionals do it. Have peace of mind. AuthorBytes.com.